giving you a voice, and making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. So for our first match of the day, we're going to stick with, I think this is going to be our last power-up match that we're going to cover, maybe forever. Um, <laughs> hopefully for a while it'll be a throwback in a couple years but pj take us to the houston championship and tell us what down when the eight seed played the one seed on touring all right so historically and you know logically being the eighth seed makes it extremely difficult to win an event right it's the lowest seed you're going up against number one right away it's not a great spot to start since 2006 only 19 alliances have accomplished the only 19 eighth seeds have accomplished this task. That's less than 2% of all elimination alliances at that time, which is over a thousand um, out of 173 different events this season, only 12 eighth seeds even made it out of the quarterfinals. Uh, three eighth seeds won events this year. That was at the Chesapeake district championships, the uh, seven rivers regional, and then here in the Turing division. So I said that we're talking, you know, less than 2% and, you know, less than probably only right around 5% even make it out of quarters. So doing it at the world championship is even more insane. Uh, so we're going to look at one of those alliances tonight, the Turing Alliance of 1533, Triple Strange out of North Carolina, uh, 1296, the Full Metal Jackets out of Texas, and 2655, the Flying Platypi out of North Carolina. Uh, they also had 3593 Invictus from Oklahoma on that alliance. Uh, we're going to be looking at quarterfinal 1-3, where 8 finishes uh, pulling off the first of their series of upsets on the road to Einstein. Uh, they play against the number one seed alliance of 2557, Soda Bots from uh, Washington in the PNW district. 2471, Team Mean Machine, also from Washington. Uh, team 120, Cleveland's team from Ohio. And 2130, Alpha Plus from Idaho. So, you know, between those four robots, I mean, we're talking about 2471 and 2557 had already won uh, PNW champs together. 2130 was finalist at two regionals and was the backup robot on that alliance. So this already looks stacked. We're already like, AC is already looking like they have a pretty tough task to go to. Well, especially with this game was so auto-focused and 2471 was one of those teams out there who had, you know, going into champs showed off a four cube auto. And I think they hit it maybe in, a couple of their qualifying matches out of 10. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that four cuber could just totally turn everything on their head. And even before the Elim started, people were talking about that, that 2471 alliance with the soda bots mm -hmm. as a possible threat to the cheesy poops alliance because of their auto. So this is how overwhelmingly a, a favorite they were. Yeah. 2471 was insane. People followed them all year. Uh, they put out, I think, I can't remember if they were part of reveal night or just put out a reveal video, but they definitely put out a video and everybody followed them the entire season. Um, they made people pay attention to PNW a little bit. So um, I guess we're just uh, going to go ahead and jump right in to this match. So first off, what happens, uh, Karthik mentions 2471's 4-cube. Uh, if we watch auto, uh, guess what they're about to hit. So in this match, we see 2471 just with this beautiful 4-cube auto. 1296 down there goes for a 2-cube, but is not able to pick up their second cube. So if we can just pause right here at the end of Autonomous. So at the end of Autonomous, 2471 has hit a four cube. 1296 has one cube on the scale. In the majority of matches this that match we've done. should be over. Yes. This is, like, you see that, you're like, okay, well, good run, number eight. You took them to three matches. Um, however, what is key is, uh, what's one thing to note about Auto is over, as Tyler just circled, uh, that they did uh, between 2655 and 1533, Blue put four cubes on their switch. Uh, I talked to one of the Strat kids from 1296. He said this was on purpose. They made sure they wanted to overload that switch because oh, then they don't fact. have to... Because then they don't... Yeah. <laughs> so, I was, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But it was like they knew they had... They planned to overload that switch because then they didn't have to worry about it for the rest of the match. That was the idea. So, um, so at the end of auto, we've got red up four cubes to one. So in most matches, this would have been game over. So if we start to roll uh, Teleop, we see 1296 and 1533 both go to start the attacking that scale right away. Once, like I said, switch is secure. Don't have to worry about 2655 is flying over to play defense. While um, Red's third robot, 2130, is starting to play portal. This is key because they're tying themselves up down at the portal as opposed to helping on the scale, playing some defense over on the opponent switch or doing anything else. They've tied themselves up in that portal game. And as we watch this match, we'll see 2655 starts to hammer on that opponent's switch, which keeps 2130 further tied up. Can't even, you know, they're not 
world – let's pause right here for a sec. Yeah. Blue's already taken back the scale. It, yes. That, that, that's crazy considering they were down by three cubes to start after auto. Yeah, if you actually – if you rewind, uh, we can see part of what happens. If we go back to 125 seconds left in the match, uh, and then we roll it for a second, we'll see 2471 gets a foul for pulling down on the scale. And then in a few seconds later, they get stuck under the scale. You can see the ref in the back start to count. Gotcha. So in this time, it's a they end up earning. So between the tip, so if they end up between the tipping the scale and then the holding it for what they did, that ends up occurring a tech foul and two regular fouls, which does not end up coming into play in this match. But what it did do was 2557 had to pause to free them from underneath the scale. And if you count in those approximately six seconds that um 2471 was stuck. Blue scores three cubes in those six seconds, which makes up that auto difference. And that's where that shift starts to happen. If 2471 doesn't get stuck under that scale, they keep playing scale. It's no big deal. But that tied up 2471 and 2557 for just those six seconds, which was just enough for Blue to catch up. When you're this number eight seed, I mean, I think we see that it's you have to play perfect in a lot of these matches and you can't let an opportunity like that slip. And this eighth seed does not. Um, and then as we roll, where was I? Preventing. And then when we get to about 80 seconds left in the match, we'll see 2471 drop a cube off the scale in the back. It's starting to fall right now. Where we are. And, um, and so while this one cube, I mean, t- blue is dropping cubes as we watch too, but when they go to retrieve this cube, 2655 switches to a really aggressive defensive strategy at this point. You see them flip around to that portal zone and they get 2471 when they're not in a protected area. They've been pretty, they've been sticking to the key. And now 2655 spends the next uh, about 50 seconds guarding 24. 2471 does not score a cube for the next 50 seconds of this match. Wow. Can I interject for one second here, yes. PJ? So this is, let's pause this right now. So when this match starts, so when you think about what happens when you have like the one seed versus the eight seed, um, where does the eight seed gain an advantage? Well, the eight seed gains an advantage by Serpentine Draft. Yes. And what this number eight alliance did was they grabbed 2655, who was clearly the best defensive robot in that division. And I think this year at Champs, there were all different strategies that an eight alliance could pull by either going with three strong scalers and trying to rotate in and out or try and go dedicated to offense and one defense. And that's what they did here. Now, normally you'd say, well, they still should be at a disadvantage because the number one alliance with two, going to offense should be overpowering. But 2655's defense was able to slow down one of 2471 or um, 2557. Mm-hmm. And also, PJ keyed on at the start of the match about 2130, them just working the exchange. That There's so many other things they could have been doing. They really turned the match into a... Two, like almost into like a two on three. They twenty one thirty was so isolated there, and this just rearranged the chess pieces and put the advantage towards blue. Very interesting. Yeah, no, exactly. And you can see like they focus on the portal at the beginning of the match, and then towards the end, with about uh, about seventy ish seconds left in the match, we see them. Uh, we see twenty one thirty switch to playing a little bit of defense on twelve ninety six um, over in the corner. But it, at that point, blue already controls the scale and. 2655 is shutting down 2471, who is much more valuable to the number one alliance than 1296 is to the blue alliance at this point. So in this sort of, I guess, defensive trade-off, blue wins that because of who gets shut down by whom. And uh, so we see a little bit of defense between 130, but it's too late in the match. Whereas we see that blue waits to play portal until you can see 1533 over there right now. They're just starting to play portal with a minute left. They wait till they're already up on the scale. They wait till they're winning the scale. They wait till 2655 has that defense pretty locked in, and then they go to play this, the portal because they can clear, they fill the cubes they need in about 20 seconds. You don't need to start that match playing the portal, which is a lot. A lot of teams made that mistake this year. And uh, so uh, as we continue to roll, this, so we see 1533, like I said, with a minute left, but they're already winning the scale. They're winning the switch. 2471 is shut down by the little defense bot, the little switch bot that could um, as we just roll. And, you know, it's just at this point, it's we start to get to, you know, that whole time-based scoring thing where even though it just keeps getting farther and farther away for blue, we just start counting. We They keep adding onto the points. They play their, uh, 
they play their boost just to at once 1533 has enough cues for it and then we get to the end game and we see them start to line up 2471 is desperately trying to control that scale 2471 had a triple climb for those who don't remember so they're desperately trying to win back that scale but what it does not do they do not have enough time to go and line up for that climb man red had to waste so many cubes on their switch yes exactly that's they they 2130 uh, had to rip apart basically their entire pyramid to keep 2655 from pulling that switch whereas which is part of why when the 1533 that blue pyramid other than auto was untouched yeah so 1533 blue just tore it apart to do the portal did the portal in 20 seconds and game over blue didn't touch their switch after auto yeah i said they scored those four cubes and never had to red never came red never came on their side of the field for that entire match and then we see uh, this we see this end with blue having their triple climb plus levitate 2471 just doesn't leave themselves enough time this is well this is well orchestrated this is just yeah. really nicely done by the blue alliance yeah, it was just that was why I watched, I watched like their entire, their entire run. I watched all the messy. Which one I would talk about? And I was like, I have to talk about the one where they're down four to one on the scale and auto, right? Like, how do you win that match? Nobody wins that match. Yeah, I never saw this one live. I only really caught up to the Terrain Alliance um, once they got around to division finals, and I was like, holy crap, number eight still alive. So this is uh, really eye opening to see how this played out here. Yeah, no, and it was. And what's the other crazy thing about 2655 that somebody uh, brought up in chat? 2655 didn't start the year as a switch bot. Uh, they started, they had an elevator at their first district event. And I think somebody told me that it basically like tore itself apart over the course of the event. Before their second district, they cut it off, turned it into this little switch defense bot, and just dominated the switch defense game. They're arguably the best switch bot in the world. I, I love it when teams aren't afraid to gut a robot mid-season, especially mm -hmm. a team who's gone with um, a more advanced, more complicated robot, and they gut it to go simple. I, it, it's a bold decision. It take, I mean, it's hard to abandon something that you worked on for you know six weeks, eight mm -hmm. weeks, 10 weeks at that point. Uh, but sometimes it really pays dividends, and uh, this was a great example of it. And also, I think that, I mean, I think this was a rough year on simple robots because, um, Switch bots, you know, to a certain degree, they definitely got neutralized compared to like if you think of um, 2017 when uh, mm -hmm. low goal robots in 2016 when low goal robots were still effective at the championship level, you know, even seeding really high. Switch bots had a hard time because, you know, one cube on the scale could just throw you completely off. Mm -hmm. But um, 2655, they were, I mean, them and the Howdy bots at South Championship just blew me away. Yeah, I can't, I'm actually. Then uh, and then even the, the uh, finalist alliance at Detroit Champs had a uh, forty nine sixty seven, who was uh, same way they started. I was at their first district event. That one team they had an elevator that was real wonky, real strange design. And then I see them. I don't see them again until MSC. And then I see them pop up at MSC with this little switch bot that just hammers the switch. And it was like I was. They were like, yeah, it wasn't gonna work. So we we took a vote as a team and decided to just to to change it. And I just think that's so commendable. Yeah, I love it when Simple uh, does well. I really do. Yeah. A um, couple questions in chat. Um, you know, just a couple comments we've got there. Uh, from Robot Nerd number one, 2655 was an amazing bot. They were able to occupy red, which left us and 1296 to the scale. That's definitely true. Gryffindor66 says, also point out that three of the eight teams during the Turing finals were North Carolina teams. Shout out to North Carolina right there. <laughs> Yeah, because it was uh, like we were mentioning actually before we got on air, I mentioned that because between because on the finals was twenty six forty two Pitt Pirates, who were another fantastic North Carolina team. Districts have definitely helped North Carolina up their competitive edge in the last couple of years. And I, I think this is kind of cool because um, North Carolina is a region that I definitely don't uh, get to follow much during the regular season. I think you know once you're uh, PJ and I have talked about this at length. Once you go districts, you're kind of you know locked into your own region. And so watching Houston champs from home, you know, where I've got multiple screens for all the divisions going, it was neat to see what North Carolina, I was really impressed by North Carolina. I was totally impressed by PNW. I never get to watch mm -hmm. them during the weeks. And so it was just kind of cool to see the powerhouses that come out of those areas. Yeah. PNW is a big one. Cause even, cause nobody goes to, cause they're most, a lot of the other districts are close enough that there's a little bit of inner district play. But like PNW, nobody goes, nobody well, from Michigan or Indiana. Look or at Israel or guys. Or, oh, I forgot about Israel. They're a district system. P PNW For now. was also the, maybe the most dramatic. Because I remember in 2010, it was mm -hmm. like a week one or two event. And I was going through the stats from a PNW event. And it's like, 
not a, I think it was like either one or no teams hung for the entire event. Yeah. And it was just like, what is this? You know, but like <laughs> regions like that, which used to be so low end or not like, mm-hmm. I mean, PNW had some of the top teams in the world this year. And just, they just kept coming out of nowhere. And it was like, it's just crazy the transformation that's happened up there. Oh, so for sure. Uh, another question in chat uh, from CE Scales underscore 1073. How rare is it for an eighth seed to win and not lose one match in ELOs? Very rare. I, was like, saying, I, don't, I don't have those numbers. Like I said, I ran the numbers on all that other stuff, but I, I didn't get that in depth, but I would guess probably almost never. <laughs> yeah, as PJ said, um, I think you said 29 victories for the number eight alliance since uh, 2006. 19. 19. I, and I think I can recall, I think there was a New England district where one team actually ran the table as an eight seed a couple of years ago. I don't remember where that was, but. Um, I do remember that, I think. 2016 Curie, it might have been, because that was the, the quote-unquote perfect reverse bracket. Yes. But I don't remember if it was all two matches, because that was where it No, it, it, I it definitely was wasn't. Okay, it, well, okay. Yeah, I thought some of those went well. well maybe the... I don't I know. Shouldn't yeah. say, I shouldn't say definitely, but yeah. there were definitely some matches that went to three. I just don't know if it was on the top side of the bracket. That's fair. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.